thank you very much for allowing me to present today at the 2020 School and University Partnership Conference for Educators. My name is Tim Miller. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about our organization, Raise Your Hand Texas. Uh, then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about Raising Texas Teachers, one of our programs. <clears throat> and then finally, for the majority of the time, I'm going to be talking to you about how school districts and teacher preparation programs can have strong partnerships to improve the teacher pipeline to produce high quality teachers. First, a little bit about myself. Um, I was an elementary special education teacher in the San Antonio area in two districts. And then um, after I got my school administration degree, I went to be the director of educational technology uh, for Northeast School District in San Antonio, and then also served as a middle school principal for several years. During that time, I also was an adjunct professor for the University in Current Word for their teacher preparation program, as well as Concordia University for their principal preparation program. After I finished my doctorate at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, we went to North Texas and I was assistant superintendent for one year and then superintendent for four years for Cleburne ISD. Uh, my wife grew up in Georgetown and so my mother-in-law uh, sent me a job posting uh, for the Texas Education Agency and we uh, re returned to Georgetown and uh, where I served as the director of educator preparation and program accountability for the Texas Education Agency for four years. And then uh, recently, uh, two years ago, uh, I left TEA and became the superintendent in residence at Raise Your Hand Texas. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, and now I want to talk to you a little bit more about my most favorite role is being a dad. Um, as you can see, I've got uh, two children. Um, they have grown uh, quite a bit from the first picture. Uh, my son is currently a junior in high school and my daughter is a senior in high school. So uh, that's a little bit about me. And this is a little bit about our organization. Uh, Raise Your Hand Texas, it's actually two different organizations. One's a foundation that provides funding for programs, and the other is a policy uh, shop that helps influence uh, state elected officials in uh, public education policy. So from this chart, you can see we've got a lot of things that we do. Uh, we uh, have our programs that I'll speak to in a minute. We've got our policy, which I'll also speak to in a bit. We also have a really strong marketing program that tells wonderful stories about the great things that are happening in K-12 schools. We also have a research wing uh, that looks at uh, best practices. And then most recently, we've developed an advocacy wing. As you can see, we've got 13 uh, people across the state who serve as uh, regional advocacy directors, and they help people get, become informed about pro-public education candidates and get people out to vote. Uh, for pro-public education candidates. The next couple of minutes, I want to talk to you more specifically about our policy wing, uh, and that includes our advocacy group, uh, as well as our research group. Um, and our goal is to support public policy solutions that invest in our students, encourage innovation and autonomy, and improve college and workforce readiness. We currently have seven policy beliefs. Uh, that you can see here on this list. I'm not going to go into all seven of them. I'm going to focus on the third one, which is teachers make a difference. Uh, but we will be fighting for K-12 public education this upcoming legislative session and to push for keeping public dollars in public schools uh, to look at all the increases that happen out of House Bill 3 and maintain those uh, so that all of our students in Texas have the brightest future. But in terms of teachers making the difference, uh, we believe that the quality of our education system and the long-term viability of our economy are inextricably linked to the effectiveness and diversity of our teachers. We recently did a poll of Texas uh, citizens and they responded that 77% of them had trust and confidence in teachers in Texas. And this compares to 61% trust and confidence in teachers on a similar nationwide poll. This pandemic that we've experienced and are currently experiencing um, has certainly uh, highlighted the value of teachers uh, from parents to business people uh, to educators themselves. So here are just a few tweets about people's responses to the work that uh, teachers do with our students and has been transferred uh, for a good part, especially in the beginning of the pandemic to uh, non teachers. So we certainly value our teachers. And so um, we understand that we've always faced a teacher shortage, 
uh, and this pandemic has the potential for making the shortage even greater. So Texas must do even more to attract and retain and develop highly effective teachers. Uh, and so in order to do that, um, we need to support uh, high quality preparation programs. We need to provide strong professional development. And we also need for the policymakers to look at other teacher recruitment training and retention strategies. So that's our policy shop. And now I want to talk to you briefly about all of our programs, but then spend uh, a little bit more time talking about our Raising Texas Teachers program. Um, our Raising School Leaders program has been around uh, for more than a decade, and this is the program that we, uh, we uh, send our principals uh, from across the state uh, to Harvard for a week-long institute, and then spend a year with them uh, implementing the things that they learned at Harvard. Our Blended Learning program is our second longest learning program. And this is where we take the very best of technology and the very best of teaching and help to individualize things for our students. Our Raising Family Partnerships program is a way for schools and districts to engage uh, their, their parents and their other family members into the uh, teaching and learning process. And our newest program uh, is Raising Texas Teachers, which includes the Charles Blitz Scholarship for um, aspiring teachers. I wanna pause for a moment and just recognize Charles Butt uh, CEO of the HEB uh, Food Stores. Uh, he is the founder of Raise Hand Texas and is our sole funder. Uh, and here in his quote, he highlights the three reasons why Raising Texas Teacher exists. And those reasons are to um, increase our um, work with uh, university teacher preparation programs, uh, to provide a Charles Butt Scholarship for aspiring teachers, and to raise the status of the teaching profession. Our goal of Raising Texas Teachers is to make sure every student in Texas has an effective teacher. Uh, and we do this through supporting continuous improvement at teacher preparation programs uh, to ensure that every new teacher is prepared to be an effective teacher on their first day in the classroom as a teacher of record. Uh, we've got four pillars uh, that we focus on as it relates to effective teacher preparation programs. Uh, the first one is continuous improvement. Uh, it's to use data, uh, to uh, look at data, to use it for imp driving uh, improvement. Uh, the second pillar is the one I speak to uh, most about today, and that's to have partnerships with school districts. Uh, we want teacher preparation programs to work closely with their local school districts to make sure that they're looking at district shortage areas and needs and to provide graduates to fill those needs. The third pillar is rigorous clinical preparation. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, the prospective teachers have ample opportunities to learn, uh, to take what they've learned in the university classrooms and apply them into the classroom settings and to provide high quality feedback uh, from the different folks that coach them and, and teach them through the process. And then the fourth pillar is a competency-based education. We wanna make sure that uh, the teacher preparation programs have a very, um, solid uh, view of what these teachers need to be able to know and do uh, before they come to teachers in your districts. We uh, put out a request for proposal and we selected uh, 10 programs uh, from across the state and those are our current partner programs. And those partner programs are able to offer the Charles Butt Scholarship for aspiring teachers. Uh, this scholarship is an $8,000 annual scholarship for up to four years. Uh, it can be uh, for high school seniors who are just getting into college, and it can also can be for people that are currently in college, uh, whether they are freshman, junior, or a uh, sophomore. Um, we just ask, um, as part of receiving the scholarship, that these folks be committed to teaching in Texas public schools, and specific, specifically in majority uh, economically disadvantaged schools or in shortage subject areas, such as bilingual education or special education. The chart on the right uh, gives you some of the benefits that students who receive this Charles Butt Scholarship for aspiring teachers uh, can uh, receive. Uh, in addition to our partners, we selected a number of emerging partners throughout the state. And so here are the logos for our current list of emerging partners. Um, you'll notice that all 11 of the Texas A&M University System schools are part of the emerging partner network. And so, uh, I'll talk more, a little bit more about the emerging partners as it relates to um, the district partnerships in a bit, 
but I did want to tell you about the third leg of the school about our Raising Texas Teachers program, and that's elevating the teaching profession. Um, we do this through focus groups, uh, public opinion polls. Uh, we've got a series of videos that talk about the voices on teaching, and those are from both our Charles Butt scholars as well as uh, people uh, who are in the uh, K-12 public education system and folks that are outside the system talking about the importance of teaching. And then recently we supported a, a Teachers Can campaign uh, to support um, the positive uh, view of teachers in the state of Texas. And so um, one thing that we recently uh, helped sponsor was World Teachers Day in the state of Texas. And uh, we really appreciate the Texas A&M University system for uh, encouraging all 11 of their programs to light up uh, their campus on World Teachers Day in our uh, Teachers Cam Blue. And uh, for those of you who are in the Corpus Christi area, I think you'll notice the entryway to the Texas A&M University of Corpus Christi campus. So we appreciate all the A&M system folks uh, helping us recognize World Teachers Day. So the reason why we focused on um, the teacher preparation programs at the university level, as you can see from this uh, chart, over the past 10 years, the preparation of teachers has been a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, if you look at the, um, the back in the 2011, 2012 school years, uh, primarily that was due to a, a massive cut uh, to the state budget for education and it impacted more of the alternative certification providers mostly. Uh, but those have slowly increased up, but we also saw a dip there between 27 and 2018 when some rules went into place to make it uh, more difficult for uh, ACP folks to get into the classroom without demonstrating that they are proficient in uh, teaching. Um, right now, uh, almost, more, almost half of our teachers are being prepared for the alternative certification route. Um, the third of folks that um, are coming out of undergraduate programs are the folks that we're currently focusing on. And we'd like to get more people interested in teaching at an uh, earlier age so that they can go through a high quality, multiple year teacher preparation program at uh, our universities. Uh, because what we've seen is that over five years, uh, the folks that stay in teaching are more likely to stay in teaching because they've gone through a university undergraduate route that you can show by that yellow bar. Uh, the state average is about 60%. Uh, folks that come out of uh, post-baccalaureate programs are a little bit higher than the average, and folks that come out of alternative programs are a little bit lower than the average. And then we've got our out-of-state folks that many times come to Texas, but because their spouse may be a military member, they don't stay in Texas too long. So that's why that five-year rate for our out-of-state folks is generally pretty low. Probably the most uh, critical reason why we wanna focus on preparing teachers who are ready to teach on day one is this graph. Uh, you can see that uh, the bars are um, based on, the blue bars are people who are doing their internship or probationary teaching. Uh, those are folks that are teaching while they're still in an alternative certification program. The orange bar are folks that are three years or less of experience. And then the gray bar are folks that are four years or more. And you can see that students who are identified as being economically disadvantaged uh, are being taught uh, a lot more by people that with fewer, no years of experience or uh, less than three years of experience. Uh, same thing with uh, our children of color in our classrooms, um, Hispanics and uh, African-American children are being taught uh, more so by people who are zero year experience teachers or three years or less. So we really wanna focus on making sure everything that can be done before a person is allowed to teach in the classroom is that they're ready to teach. And so what we've done is we've partnered with a couple organizations. We're working with the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, with our partner programs, and we're working with an organization called TPIUS for our emerging partner programs. The reason why we picked TPIUS is because they have a pretty solid assessment that they do to give programs a benchmark about where they're at on five different key areas of teacher preparation. Uh, this uh, data is then used to drive programmatic improvement through actionable, meaningful feedback with the ultimate goal of improving student learning through improving teacher preparation. There are five assessment areas that TPIUS uses. The first is quality selection. 
Um, the second is the quality of the content knowledge and teaching methods that the teacher candidates receive. Uh, the third one, and this is a very critical one, is the quality of clinical placement, the types of feedback that those candidates receive, and then of course, how those candidates perform in the classroom. The fourth assessment area is the quality of program performance management. And this is all about data. Uh, how you collect data, how you use data, how you share data, and how you use data for continuous improvement. And then the fifth component, which we think is probably one of the more important ones because the universities cannot do this alone. They need to have quality program partnerships with their school districts and their other partners so that they can have a shared vision uh, and then they can share and monitor data and they can work together to make the magic happen. So the, for the rest of the presentation, uh, I want to speak about this quality of program partnerships uh, domain. Um, we have a four point rubric um, that we look at when we use the TPIUS assessment, and it ranges from inadequate to needs improvement to good to strong. And today, what I'll be sharing are the strong components of the rubric, uh, but just to let you know that our programs are all uh, on a range. There are certain areas where they've got inadequate. There are, are many areas where they are needs improvement. They've got several areas that are good and we've got some programs that already have strong in some of these areas. So I'm sharing you the strong just to know that what is the end goal for how we expect all of our emerging partners to be working with their district partners. The district provider partnership uh, domain has four indicators. Uh, as you see on the screen here, the numbers in parentheses out to the right are the different criteria. So I'm going to go through each of these indicators, uh, describe the criteria, and be, give you a description of what it means when we talk about all of these different things. So the first one is partnership performance management. Um, and the criteria is listed there. Uh, we want to have the partners to have shared goals. Uh, we'd like for them to have a formal partnership organization. Uh, we need to make sure they're looking at quality data and they're looking at that data uh, frequently to monitor their progress along the way. Uh, we also would want the district partner to be looking at the coursework quality uh, to make sure that there's tight connections between what's happening in the classrooms at the university level and the application into the clinical field experience. And then uh, the very last one is making sure that there's quality improvement planning, making sure there's goals that are being set and there's progress in meeting those goals. So the first criteria is shared goals with mutual benefits for all partners. Uh, and this description is that the partnership has articulated in writing a shared mission that's developed jointly, uh, that's focused on recruiting, preparing, and supporting well-prepared new teachers. Uh, these shared beliefs and goals directly impact the partnership. Many times uh, school districts and universities have a memorandum of understanding or some other document that lines these things out but probably the most important thing is the conversations uh, and the collaboration that happens in developing those shared missions and those beliefs and those goals. The second criteria is to have a formal partnership organization. So once you have that formal written agreement that's signed off by senior leaders at both the school district and the university, um, you develop a governance structure that develops policy and oversees the implementation of those actions. Um, there are key roles and responsibilities that are articulated in writing, including how much time, resources, and staff expertise are going to be committed by both parties. Uh, and then you have regular formal meetings. And those can be face-to-face -face or they can be virtual. But the important thing is that there's communication and collaboration so that everybody, the leaders, the faculty, and staff, all the partners have frequent interactions. The third criteria in this indicator is quality data. We want to make sure that partners exchange information so they can plan, monitor, and improve organizational activities and outcomes. The information that's shared by and with each partner is high quality data, and it's used productively in collaborative efforts to plan, monitor, and improve program outcomes. The program collects and uses multiple sources of high quality internally and externally validated data to monitor ongoing performance. This next criteria is very similar to the, the previous one, but this is making sure that you're frequently looking at the monitoring of the data. You're looking at leading indicators and not just focusing on the end of the year results. 
So things that you'd be looking at are things regarding recruitment, selection, and production of teachers, to make sure that you're looking at uh, systematic monitoring uh, that takes place for the preparation coursework, field experiences, the observations that are happening for the clinical teachers, as well as the feedback system that's used by the field supervisors and the cooperating teachers. You wanna gauge and, and determine how well the candidates are performing, both along the way in the program and then after they graduate and they become teachers of record. So all these results are monitored and they're judged against partnership goals and benchmarks that are set up in the shared goal setting. And that effective monitoring is closely linked to improvement planning and action steps. The fifth criteria for this indicator is that monitoring of coursework quality and coursework clinical connections. We wanna make sure that the things that are being taught in the universities uh, are able to be applied in the real world through clinical field experiences by the clinical teachers. Um, so that means that the districts and the universities need to get into each other's businesses a bit and making sure that things that are being taught reflect what the district needs. And those things that are being taught are actually being applied in a real world setting. The final criteria for this indicator is quality improvement planning through district provider partnership. So each party takes responsibility for progress and challenges in meeting partnership commitments and goals. You've got a formal system for improvement planning. You're looking at high quality data. You've got effective monitoring. You're involving all relative stakeholders and you've got measurable improvement goals that you're looking at along the way, celebrating your successes, addressing the challenges as they arise to meet the goals of the teacher quality pipeline that y'all both agreed to. So the second domain, as I said earlier, is looking at enrollment and completion for provider programs. And there are five criteria in this area. There is the recruitment pipeline strategy. There's looking at who you're enrolling into the program. It's looking at who's exiting the program. It's making sure that those people that are completing the program are coming to the school district in subjects and grades that are relevant to the district needs. And then there's the support for graduates who are employed as new hires in the district. So this first criteria, recruitment pipeline strategy. So you're looking at district school level data together. And then you come up with a written recruitment and support plan with specific goals in terms of how many teachers you need and what subjects, what grades, at which schools. You've got benchmarks to show progress along the way. You identify responsible parties and you've got progress monitoring to make sure that your goals are being met. And so this can be an example of looking at your high school students, looking at members of your community college, uh, looking at current employees that work in your district as paraprofessionals, uh, recruitment strategies for career changers who wanna become teachers all the different ways that you can get people into the teacher preparation pipeline need to be part of this recruitment pipeline strategy. And the reason why this is important is remember the slide is that whereas there was some growth over the past couple of years in terms of people becoming teachers, we showed a little bit of a dip uh, between 2017 and 2018 and potentially could see another dip depending on how the state budget goes in the next legislative session. The second criteria is looking at the demographics of your people who you're enrolling into your teacher preparation program. Uh, you wanna make sure that this demographics match up with the demographics of your student population in your region. Uh, I realize that each district and each campus has a different set of demographics, but that's why it's important for the teacher preparation program and the school district partners to talk about uh, what's going on in terms of trends, in terms of the last three years at the minimum and to make sure that the program has a written plan for trying to address these trends. The reason why this is important is because right now there's a mismatch between the demographics of the teachers in the state of Texas and the demographics of the student. Uh, the black African-American population is pretty uh, equal uh, as well as um, other races beyond black, Hispanic, and white. But as you can see, we've got the majority of students in the state of Texas who are Hispanic and not a majority of teachers in the state of Texas who are Hispanic. So it's not just about enrolling people into your program, it's also about making sure that they get through the program, they get their degree, they get the certification, and they're ready to teach. So in addition to looking at enrollment of, uh, the, the enrollment of folks, we also wanna look at the demographics of the completion of people in your programs. 
Uh, the fourth criteria uh, for this indicator is looking at, okay, we looked at demographics, but we also want to make sure that they're certified in the areas that uh, school districts need. And that can be both at the grade level, whether it's middle school or high school, or if it's a subject area, say like bilingual education or special education. And so we encourage uh, partners to look at three year trends to make sure that as far out as you can look into your crystal ball, what is it that you're gonna need in your school or district? And is the teacher preparation program providing uh, people in those areas? And then the last component of this um, indicator is criteria five, and that's support for graduates employed in new districts, new hires in the district. Um, so this happens along the way as part of people become teachers through those field-based experiences and clinical field experiences. Uh, we wanna make sure that uh, the cooperating teachers uh, and the field supervisors are on the same page with the way that they provide support and feedback. And then we would like to see once people are graduated from the teacher, pre teacher preparation program is that type of mentoring and support continues uh, through a partnership between the district and the university preparation programs so that um, high quality teachers will begin in schools and after five years, those high quality teachers stay in teaching preparation. Um, so we want that yellow bar uh, to be up at the 80%, 90% level. Uh, we understand that um, excellent teachers uh, sometimes have an interest in becoming school librarians or school counselors or even school administrators. And so there is going to be a certain percent of people that uh, leave the teaching profession and go into a different part of the education um, profession. But um, the majority of folks um, that we need in the classrooms, we need to do a better job of retaining and supporting them. Uh, the third domain is that content knowledge and teaching methods preparation. Uh, and this criteria, this, this domain has two criteria. Uh, the first one is uh, making sure that we're addressing the district needs by engaging key stakeholders in program design, monitoring, and improvement, and then creating connections to practice speaking coursework and the clinical application of coursework knowledge feedback and loop to district and students, schools. So this first criteria is that we will want the district partners and the university partners uh, to work together. Uh, there needs to be conversations uh, with the partners about what the expectations are for new teachers to be working in a particular district. So if there's a particular um, curriculum, if there's a particular teaching strategy, those to the extent possible need to be integrated into the curriculum that are being, uh, that's being used to produce the teachers so that there doesn't have to be a lot of reteaching, there doesn't have to be a lot of expense from the, from the teacher, from the school district program uh, to train those people once they come out of the teacher preparation program. So there's frequent engagement. We're talking about the design, the monitoring, and the improvement of the programming courses so that there's high quality trainings provided that are aligned to district needs. Uh, ideally, there'd be some co-teaching of courses. Uh, a lot of times universities are teaching courses on the campuses themselves within the school district. Uh, and other times the, uh, the, the teacher, mentor teachers and other master teachers are going to the university and co-teaching classes there. Um, but the biggest thing is that we're looking at the pre-K through 12 curriculum as a resource for teaching content. So there's a really good tight match between what's happening at the university level and what's happening in the K-12 system. The second criteria uh, is, again, creating those connections to practice between coursework and the clinical application of that coursework knowledge feedback loop to districts and schools. So we wanna make sure that what's happening in the uh, courses at the university the teacher candidates are able to practice them and to learn from their mistakes underneath the guidance of a master teacher uh, who provides feedback as well as the field supervisor who provides feedback. And there's that tight connection between the firsthand knowledge that the candidates are receiving uh, on the campus with the uh, learning that they're happening in the program uh, faculty coursework that's being provided. So the very final uh, domain in this area is uh, clinical placement of program candidates. And there are six components to this criteria. Uh, the first one is shared expectations for student teaching and high quality feedback that's provided as teacher candidates as well as 
looking at the student performance in the classrooms. Uh, the second component is the length of the placement and when they can get into the classroom. The third is the selection of the schools in which the clinical teachers are placed. The fourth one is the selection of the cooperating teachers. Uh, the fifth one is the district's role in training uh, on the observation and the evaluation of those clinical teachers. And then the final one is the clinical on-site supports. So the first criteria, um, again, we want to make sure that there's clear aligned expectations about the goals and the outcomes of clinical placements. Uh, many universities have hundreds of hours of field-based experiences where they try to get their teacher candidates in at the sophomore, junior level to see high quality uh, teaching going on in the classrooms. But where the rubber really meets the road is when they have their student teaching or clinical teaching. And that's where we want to make sure that there are just really good, consistently high goals for performance that are both communicated to the field supervisors uh, from the university and the cooperating teachers from the school district to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of what's expected of those clinical teachers. And they're providing very strong feedback uh, to the clinical teachers along the way to make sure that they're prepared to the best possible way. The second criteria, and this one uh, with the, the pandemic and the, the switch for many districts from a traditional face-to-face -face, uh, setting to a more virtual setting or something in the middle has been a challenge for many of our um, university preparation programs, but we also have lots of examples of success about how uh, the teacher candidates can be really tied into the virtual learning that's happening with uh, the students and the teachers in the school districts. So ideally, uh, teacher candidates would be consistently placed at the beginning of the school term, uh, say in August, and then teach for at least a full school term. Um, right now, the state minimum is 14 weeks of student teaching. Uh, many of our emerging partners and partners have extended that to two full semesters, and some of them are looking at trying to do a third semester. So that is the, our goal for the clinical placement timing and love. Start them out at the beginning of the school year, and give them the opportunity to work with a master teacher throughout the full school term. In terms of criteria three, this is the selection of placement schools. And ideally, we want folks to be placed in schools that are high performing and who are improving over the past two years. Uh, we want to make sure that they have a, a diverse student body, both uh, socioeconomic status as well as ethnicity. And we just want to make sure that there's an intentional plan for putting in folks uh, to staff high need schools with well prepared teachers. So that's a, 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 a partnership again, a communication about what are the best schools to be using as professional development schools for the university programs. The fourth is your cooperating teachers. And this is the person that's gonna be spending the most time with our clinical teachers. So we wanna make sure that these people are chosen jointly by the program in the district. We're looking at folks with experience, with a track record of student success, and uh, to the extent possible, a, a person who knows how to mentor and coach. But if they don't know how to mentor and coach, there needs to be a strong district role in the training on the observation and the evaluation of the student teachers. Uh, so that field supervisors and classroom property teachers both receive regular substantive training uh, and have measurable standards for reliability to make sure that when one person observes a student teacher and another person observes a student teacher, and their ratings are, are similar, so that the student teachers will receive high quality observation and feedback. So the last uh, criteria in this area is clinical onsite supports. And this you know, frequently is when the field supervisor comes out and does an observation, but we understand right now in this time of COVID, uh, we're moving toward more virtual uh, environments as well as using video uh, for providing uh, field support. So as much as possible, having that, um, uh, that immediate contact with the teacher candidate, uh, both before the lesson uh, and after the lesson to provide the high quality supports and that's coherent, that, that, that are coherent, that are aligned with what the school district and, and the provider have agreed upon. And many of our school districts uh, use the T-test as their uh, teacher evaluation system. And therefore, a lot of our emerging partners are using a version of T-test uh, to provide that uh, competency-based uh, rubric to determine whether or not their teachers are proficient and ready to teach on year one. 
So in summary, um, we want to make sure that the preparation of our future teacher workforce is strong. And in order for that to be strong, there needs to be strong partnerships between teacher preparation programs and school districts. These partnerships need to be win-win, they need to be mutually beneficial, and include shared expectations and decision making. Um, strong partnerships can also include uh, external organizations. So organizations like Raise Your Hand Texas are there to help support teacher preparation programs in school districts to, to have those partnerships. Because um, strong partnerships are necessary because the future of Texas is in our public schools. So um, in closing, I just wanna thank y'all again very much for letting me to present today. Um, hopefully you've uh, got some questions and you can send those questions to me directly uh, or you could, uh, um, I've got my email on the next screen. Uh, you can uh, email me or call me if you've got questions. But I do want to remind everybody that uh, Friday, October 30th is the last day for early voting in Texas uh, for the November 3rd election. So please, if you haven't done so already, make a plan to vote, uh, go vote, get encourage your other form, fellow educators uh, to vote with you. Um, we've got lots of voting resources on our raiseyourhandtexas.org uh, vote page. So please feel free to, to view that page and to uh, um, get out there and vote. Um, so thank you again very much. Here are my uh, email addresses and my um, phone numbers. Uh, and uh, I look forward to speaking to y'all in the future about this very important topic.